Scene One of Gruach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gruach by Gordon Bottomley. Persons Conan, Thane of Fortingal. Read by M. B. An envoy of the King of Scotland. Read by Bruce Peary. Donal, a steward. Read by Algie Pug. Two serving men. Read by Todd. Read by Chuck Williamson. Morag, the Lady of Fortingal, Conan's mother. Read by Capricia Page. Fern, her daughter. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Gruach, her niece. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Margaret. Read by Tricia G. Two young serving women. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Read by April Gonzalez. A kitchen girl. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. The scene is laid in Scotland in the early Middle Ages. Scene One. The scene is the hall of a small black stone castle in the north of Scotland. In the back wall are round arched folding doors to the right above which a large bell hangs. To the left is a narrow, tall, round-topped doorway of a staircase that curves upward out of sight. High above these doors an arcade of short, thin pillars and small round-topped arches runs from left to right. In the right wall toward the back is a low doorway of a descending stair. Along this wall, from front to back, stands a heavy table with accompanying benches. In the left wall is a stone fireplace, with pillared cowl. A log fire burns on the hearth, and two lighted torches are set in rings that project from the wall above. There is a curtained recess between the fireplace and the back wall. Morag, the Lady of Fortingal, a gaunt old woman, sits in a great chair at the far side of the hearth, warming her hands and listening to Donal, her steward, an old man who stands near. Conan, her son, the thane of Fortingal, sits at the near side of the hearth in another chair, averted from her, wetting a hunting-spear with a small stone. In front of the fire, but at some little distance from it, Fern, her daughter, sits on a stool, stitching at a heavy white robe covered with a meandering close pattern in gold. The robe is long and ample, and spreads over an empty stool that stands still further from the fire. The meat is killed, the veal is blooded, the trout are caught. Lambs are too young to kill, so far were needed. The mead vats are well filled, and now the women make ready to bake all night. Then stop such waste of fire. Send to the village and tell the bonders' wives that every house must send a basket full of loaves at dawn for their lord's wedding feast. What else is to do? Before we sleep, the stable should be garnished for the guest horses. Some ride early, and some ride earlier. Tomorrow will be too late, and we must work with torches. Waste, waste, and never any forethought is here. Let one sit up till midnight. Then the moon will join him and work with him, and save the torch. The bridal chamber is arrayed and ready. New rushes mixed with lavender are strewn there. But Margaret bids me say she waits to know how many chambers for tomorrow's guests. She must prepare, and when you give out the linen for the beds. When there is April weather and a moon, our neighbours will not think of sleeping here. They will ride home. Mother, we shall be scorned in all the glens, if high-born women are sent out from our gate, to ride in festal clothes put on to grace us, across Sith Chalion on a frosty night, or the Black Mountain. Our guests will all ride home. Bar the great door for the night when you go down. The lady, Gruach. Is she still out? Then leave it. Donal makes an obeisance and goes out by the low doorway in the right wall. What kind of half-man have I born and suckled, who lets his bride on his wedding eve go out alone, and loiter in secret glades and lonely uplands? Son, 
Will you let your wife run wild before the wind of her will like this? My cousin Gruach, when she first grew tall, forbade that I should follow her, or watch toward what refuges of forest and sky unbearable moods might take her, and she said she needed that escape from kinsfolk's minds. So why should I haunt her last free maiden night more than a hundred nights of other springs? When a most beautiful woman can be wearied and burdened by a girl's dearest delight of stitching her wedding kirtle and with spun gold adding glory to glory for her own shoulders, will sight of a patient bridegroom bring her ease? She wrought all day, till, when the evening sun was in the elder tree and a thrush sang there, she asked me if I could sit still for ever, and said that she must go. You are not wise, mother, to marry her now. Her thoughts are not with us, she is not ours. Last night, soon after midnight, I awoke to a sense of light, to a light held in the air. She stood above me like a chill, pale pillar. I sat up, but she did not notice me. Her eyes were fixed on something above my brow. Will you not let me alone? she said so softly it drew my tears. I am not yours, she said. I shall be taken from you if you persist. I cannot think myself into your lives for ever. I cannot breathe your little air. Where is the door? There must be a way out. Will you not show it to me? That pitiful, unnatural gentleness changed her to something so unlike herself I shivered and could not stop. And when she left me I dared not follow or move, for I had heard that if sleepwalkers are wakened they may die. I found her lying uncovered on her bed in the early morning. She knew not why, she said, for she had never left it in the night. Disquiet that thus lights up dark places of being, and parts the uneasy body from the mind, is surely a dreadful force best left unstirred. Is it not then a cause, that you should more examine what you are doing? She never wandered in the night before. Can two young women of blood be afraid of marriage? Her brooding and your shyness are too much fixed on the occurrences of a single day. Whatever joy or sorrow the morrow stirs, the day after to-morrow there will return this old still life of duty, and Gruach next will weep that nothing is changed. Her mother's lands march with your father's. They must be joined again. Her father was of dead King Kenneth's breed, and though her line is dispossessed, she is yet royal in some men's minds, heiress of peril, but also with great chance. And this my son shall take and make his own. Yes, mother. My cousin Gruach is my friend. She knows I shall not be too stern or strict, and that I understand her uneasy ways and how to let her alone when she's unhappy. Since all her hunted kindred were put down and we have sheltered her, her fief and ours have been so fortunately governed as one that this must be continued. And Sister Fern, if her fair virginal life is in some danger from men of the new king's house, is it not wise she should be covered by our quieter name, disguised in our reputed loyalty? You are too eager in your sympathy to see my mother's wisdom. The great door opens from without. Hush, Conan, she is here. Be short with her. Gruach enters and closes the door behind her. She is tall and large-framed, with firm, soft contours, and features, and a calm expression. She moves and speaks with unconscious deliberateness. Her thick, sleek yellow hair falls on each side of her face, and is bunched at intervals with knots of green ribbon. She carries a great tangle of spring wildflowers in the lap of her green gown, caught up with one hand. Morag continues. Girl, you are out too late. Look better to it. Your kirtle is wet? Your shoes are clean. You have been barefoot. A barefoot bride is our shame. Will you still chide me? It is my last night. Yes, yes, chide me once more. Tell me my faults and satisfy your instinct. For to-morrow I shall become a wedded woman like you. And wedded women take each other's part. Supper time is long past. We did not wait. Tell Ferdin he may set your supper now. Where have you been so long? Oh, I cannot eat to-night. Let that pass, too. I went to lose myself. I found the spring. See how a little sweetness has beguiled me. These foolish things looked up at me. 
She spills her lap full of flowers over ferns embroidery. Oh, cousin, you hurt! Your carelessness will not count how much still love I have put into your gown. Green sap and petal dust will stain it forever. The tissue was pure. Look here and here and be sorry. Oh, nothing can mar the gown of a happy bride. I can only wear it once. It is fresh enough for that. And yellow and yellow on gold will never show. I hate all yellow things, and most the yellowness of springtide life. Yellow and yellow, cowslip, crocus, and primrose, daffodil and jasmine, yellow and yellow. These commoners of spring put me in mind that now the darker flower which matches me in loneliness, a purple hellebore, should also have returned to glen of shadows. I came through Castle Wood and over the ridge, longing for it as I have longed for a friend. But though I have fostered it year after year, at last it has not come to me with spring. Will you never, never forget the dreadful flower which in our childhood made me sick with fear? You loved it for that fear. It is the very color of poison and sin, of bruises and dead men's lips. Why will you seek it? For its sullen, angry beauty and evil intent. I love to feel it would kill me if it could, and that I need not let it unless I wish. And when a fierce bird is beautiful it is then more beautiful by its fierceness, and that rare flower is thus more beautiful by its wickedness. Come, bride in the bud, you are in my care to-night. You must hasten to your chamber and change your skirts. They are wet half-way to the knee, or the wife's new wisdom will not preserve you from too much fever to-morrow. Fern, breaking the thread with which she has been stitching. Stay, cousin. Your gown is finished. Take it with you. Sweet cousin, I have been wayward and unkind to leave you alone to labour on this monotony. Let it remain a moment until I have changed. I will finish my side as well. It is finished. Gruach, kneeling by Fern impulsively. You darling workfellow and playfellow, and mother kin and rosy bedfellow of long ago, pardon my little hard heart. You take our frets and burdens on yourself and never tell us until we are too late for everything except to be forgiven. I wish you could so lighten all my task. Your love brings strength, and it will be your love that presses and nestles about me when I wear it. When I have stripped myself to-morrow night it shall be cherished unblemished for your bridal. To-morrow I follow a bride for the third time, and thrice a bridesmaid and never a bride, say gossips. Gruach starts abruptly to her feet and stuffing the golden gown into a tight bundle under her arm, goes to the staircase. Wild thing! What have I said to grieve you now? You are crushing it! You are cruel to crush it! Cruel! It will only look like dirty linen now. Gruach, turning at the foot of the stair. It is too heavy. It is as heavy as fetters. Its weight will sleek it when I put it on, and none will want to wear it after me. She disappears at the turn of the stair. Presently she passes from left to right within the arcade above. I had better leave my door ajar to-night. She will lie still to-night. She has tired herself. It is over. She is spent. She will submit. She can do nothing more before to-morrow. And when to-morrow is here she must go forward, from station to station of hallowing and lost hopes checked by the guest's cold eyes if she would double, and no one will come here who would listen to her. She could only tell of me that I would love her and be her very sister, but no one will come. The bell over the door sounds once, a deep sonorous note. The women look at each other. Again it sounds once. Who rides so late? Surely wedding guests. Nay, there is but one horse. I heard its feet while Gruach was saying something just now. Donal enters by the door on the right and opens the great door. The King's Envoy, outside. I ride in the King's name. In the King's name I require men's service. Whose is this strong house? This is the house of the Dane of Fortingal. I ride in the King's name on an errand of weight. I ask the thane of Fortingal for a man to find me the speediest road to Inverness. You are far from any road to Inverness. 
Then bring me to your lord. Donal opens the door wider. There enters a handsome hawk-faced young man with a fighter's mouth and jaw. He wears a leathern riding-dress. In the front of his cap a purple flower is fastened. Donal, approaching Conan. Sir, a man of the king's asks speech with you. He goes out to the right as Conan comes forward to meet the envoy. You are belated, sir. Your horse has foundered, or you have missed your way? I am an envoy, Thane, of my great kinsman Duncan, the King of Scotland, of all Scotland, to Thorfinn, the Jarl of Caithness, a threatening man. I ought to be in Inverness with dawn, but twilight overtook me in a strange country. You have ridden a county wide of your straight way, but every northerly track will take you there, and the full moon will serve you many hours if you push on at once. The wind has veered, good Thane, to the north again. The mounting snow-packs clot in the steely sky. Your moon is buried. Young spring will die of exposure. This is no night to ride in, no light to ride in, when the rider is lost already. I must desire your courtesy and duty to lodge my horse and me till morning comes. I could have wished it so. Yet, on this eve, our attention lies elsewhere. There, there are other guests. The, the occasion is not common. Morag, who has been watching the envoy anxiously. My son forgets when the king asks. It is our right to give. You come, young sir, on the edge of a bustling hour, of some festivity, that already checks our poor ability and exercise of hospitality. At dawn more guests need undivided honour, but until then what we can give is yours. Is great news in the bud that you ride so hard? Such urgency might mean some vile revolt threatens King Duncan's blessed heart-easing peace. I go to tell Caithness that the king's wife has borne a son, and to require of him an oath of loyalty to the child Malcolm. His disaffection has not prospered lately. He is bruised and in recoil, and it is thought that if he is confirmed in what he holds, he will consent to grant to a helpless child, a word he is too sore to speak for a king. Do you believe he will? Not I. Nor I. Yet this child's weight may hold the king's throne firm. I trust our lady the queen is well recovered. It is all men's grief that she is not recovered. She lies most piteously indifferent to life and child. She wastes. She is almost white. She cannot mount the throne steps. Her leech says she cannot safely bear another child. Conan softly to fern as she gathers together her embroidery implements tell gruach there's a king's man in the house bid her keep to her chamber until he's gone i never saw her she is not one of us her foreign breed is plainly too light and poor to make a scottish mother a scottish king should wed in his own mountains where the women are prideful and hard and quickened i have heard she has some beauty and birth but can a stranger bear a right king for us? She is a most sweet lady, so excellent in steadfastness and grace that she is fit to be a Scottish woman and queen of Scottish men. Conan, softly to Fern. Go, go. She is tall and moves as if she walked in her own mountains. She is gleaming pale, a daughter of snow-lipped seas, a golden lady he falters and pauses his eyes fixed on the staircase arch where gruach has appeared she is wearing the white and gold gown her hair is knotted up about her ears and covered with a narrow white flowered veil of gold tissue held in place by a flashing circlet and falling among the folds of her train as she stands on the first step her eyes fixed on the envoy the gold of her gown flickers in the wavering torchlight so that she seems to hover in a light of her own, by contrast with the moving shadows of the gloomy hall and the sombre apparel of the others. Fern, who has started to her feet at Conan's second bidding, meets her at the foot of the stair. "'Cousin, what have you done? You have worn it too soon. You are fay. You will bring ill fortune on us.' "'Lady, I see that I must be unwelcome, and that you are ready for friends, not strangers now.' I am urged to this intrusion by my service, which is the king's, and the strict terms of it. 
your house folk have received me do not rebuke them i have laid the king's will heavily on them but add your kindness to their tolerance of my unpardoned coming my lord in that you are come you are welcome i am not mistress here until to-morrow yet if i may i will add my share of grace to greet you earnestly as i should for a king lady i thank you i i am unfortunate to have missed your entrance i have not heard your name i am nephew and next of kin to the thane of gloms old sinel the king's cousin macbeth is my name i knew there was a quality in this night we are required to lodge it suitably the chamberwoman is idle and sluggish again there is not one guest-room swept or curtained yet and although my miny of maidens should come soon to change their gowns there would it not be well to put him into the bridal chamber to-night none other is ready none is fragrant enough i have looked at it but now it is strange and fair margaret shall deck it anew ere the feast is over and i'll array for church in my old cell morag dryly and bowing curtly to the envoy a bride must have her way he takes the torch from one of the rings in the left wall what have you done with your horse where is it now at the ring in your outer gate i will send a man to stable it your pardon i must go down to my patient friend or his nut-brown eyes will not meet mine to-morrow our journey will be longer i'll go with you you do not know the stable uh, mother shall i unlock the oat-bin for him i will go before you he opens the door will you come with me now i thank you thane and follow they go out conan outside a sudden frost and a hard the sweat in your horse's coat will be like chain-mail what kind of man are you to leave a good horse out in a night like this and call yourself his friend the great door closes behind them gruach has remained standing motionlessly facing the place whence the envoy spoke to her her eyes downcast her face tranquil as if she is inwardly absorbed in an entrancing thought morag approaches her the wife of fortingall will take her place will she but when she does she shall feel sharply the wife of fortingall must keep her place and leave her lord to welcome handsome strangers and dangerous unknown farers in the dark a woman wears her wedding-gown but once and there's a fate in airing it too soon the mocking mischief of your changeling's heart may well have wrought that when you strip to-night you strip the pride of being the lady of fortingall yet you must doff it now on the instant go get you to bed and hide the stranger must not see those eyes again he does not hunt you or suspect your birth but if he remembers you by seeing you too long your noticeable clothing and keen gaze he may ask questions about you go i say turning to fern daughter tell ferdin to bring food and mead not the old mead for the young knight's evening meal but no i must go myself or the kitchen wenches will send up the wedding meats to save themselves the grievance of late work she goes out by the low door to the right dear cousin will you not retire before she can return did you speak to me my mother wishes us to go we are up too late even now think of what the dawn will bring he is the most beautiful man i have seen in all my life how can you say such a thing how wicked you must be i am afraid of you think what you owe to conan if conan heard he might forget the knight as his first guest conan could not get near him he would kill conan he is a noble man and very fair well then brave gentle fern he shall not go i'll bid him to my marriage and maybe he shall hand you to church fern stooping look look this little flower was in his cap when he came in he doffed it to you alone it must have fallen then you never saw it his flower it is my colour give it to me fern kissing the flower she has picked up no i do what is asked of me each hour of life and you all take all i give and never notice that i am ever the one who must stand aside and in their turn your children will assume i am the one who foregoes who does not count i shall have naught of my own when i am old but i'll not give you this gruach 
seizing Fern's wrist and twisting it. But I will have it. Oh, you hurt, you hurt, let me alone. Not till you throw it away. Oh, 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 oh! Soul of a wolf, take it! She drops the flower. Gruach releases her and stoops to it. Fern returns to her stool by the fire and seats herself with her back to Gruach, chafing her injured wrist and pressing it to her, her shoulders twitching as if with insupportable pain. Gruach, kissing the flower. Thou thing of tender substance and silent life, the spirit of thy softness enters me, when surfaces of lips and fingers meet thy filmy stillness. I fear to press my longing to thee, lest I interrupt the life I'll fixed for ever with my touch. She fastens the flower in the lacing of her bodice below her throat. Lie there, move with my life breath. Ah, oh, look up and breathe again to me his earlier warmth, as if the vital tremor of his person mixed with my heat that veins thy texture now. Thou hast been set above his brow. Sink down, bring down to me his head in here, in here. She presses her hands to her bosom. The great door opens. Conan enters with the torch, and crossing the hall replaces it in its ring. The stable knaves have waited for no moon. The stalls are trimmed. The bracken is changed already. Fern, recovering herself with difficulty. Where is our guest? He may come whenever he chooses. The envoy enters by the great door and closes it behind him. My lord Macbeth, I trust my cousin has found a lodging for your horse that is to your mind, one worthy of a life that has your love and bears a precious burden, a king's message. Why do you gaze on me so steadfastly, as if I am not here? It is your flower. A spay wife under a riven, star-lit fir gave one to me as I rode out from Schoon. She said it opened from a root of death, and that it should bring to me some kind of fortune. I flew it in my cap for death to see and take a challenge from, and then forgot it somewhere upon my way. I found it in the rushes on the floor. Its color spoke to my heart. I put it on. But let me be your spay wife and bring you fortune. She loosens the flower. My flower has found its fortune. Let it remain. I have no fortune. I come of a root of death. Like would kill like. You must take your fortune from me. Conan has been watching uneasily for an opportunity to intervene. Gruick holds out the flower to the envoy. As their hands meet and linger on it, Morag enters from the right, followed by a serving-man bearing a plate of food, utensils, a cup, and a flagon. Morag pointing to the table. Put it down there. Hasten your fellows to bed. He obeys and goes out to the right. Morag turns to the envoy. It is late, young lord. My house and I are ashamed you have stood so long in our gates without rest or food. If you will partake such food as the hour affords, it is set here for you to honour us. You must pardon us that we do not sit with you. A long and toilsome day of happiness begins for us ere daylight, and my slow hands must minister to the bride before she sleeps. A bride who overslept would be a jest. When more new things than a girl has had in a lifetime are there, it be hard for the putting on. So now we must withdraw too soon for courtesy. Dear niece, go you before, and I will bring my neck-chains, brooches and pins, the linens, the shoes, and a cloak to outshine your gown. I give you good-night, my lord. I am to be made a bride to-morrow, my lord. A bride claims happiness from every quarter, and I shall be the happier if you will tarry among my bridal guests and follow me to church and return here. My husband will go hunting after the service. Nay, cousin, the day after. I ask your pardon, my lord, the day after. That is a day the better if you abide with us and ride with him. He has wetted his spears and paunchers all this day, and offers them for the courtesy of your usage. Cousin, not the old spear with the bronze blade. If you can well endure our wilding pleasures. I could not slight the hospitality of such a day. 
i thank you for your leave to ride with you to church i shall delay so far you are good my lord good night god find you a fair awakening gruach passes out of sight up the stair donal enters from the right fastens the great door crosses at the back to the foot of the stair and stands at the far side of it he is followed by two serving men a boy an old woman margaret and two sturdy young women they move quickly and ascend the stair in turn when the last has disappeared a lanky girl enters in the wake of the others moving awkwardly in slatternly outgrown clothes rubbing her eyes and snivelling donal motions to her to hasten she stumbles up the stair the whole train is seen to pass behind the high arcade from left to right donal turns to follow Stuart, two hours before the first false light the men must set the long hall tables up the women must have the seething pots and steam donal making a reverence our lady's will shall be done he passes out of sight up the stair a bride has privileges lord macbeth to be much considered and even the more indulged we should accept her wishes at this time and i am grieved there is no chamber arrayed for any guest yet and that there is no place unspoken for at the bride's board to-morrow we must with true unwillingness leave you here until the time for your going the house is yours in our intention let not our imperfection that is of the hour not in our hearts obscure our watchful duty done to our king i thank the lady of fortingall for much a chair by her hearth and my cloak about me will serve until i can take the road if i have your leave i will open both hall door and stable door let down the drawbridge and ride out and away into the north by the moon nor call your housefolk still earlier than your needs morag at the stairfoot if your high duty sends you to horse so soon we shall not see you again i trust your journey will prosper and be speedy she passes out of sight up the stair the hall grows colder after the turn of midnight there are logs in the corner and if the frost should deepen you will find furs behind the curtain there may you rest well i thank your gentle thought fern passes out of sight up the stair have you saddled the horse before in the king's yard do you know the way of the bit a noble woman is handed to you to-morrow no one need wish you joy you receive its cause such breeding as hers should never be shut up in these harsh walls and mountains and hard cold mines if you will ride with your matchless wife to schoon when i return the king shall hear of you and take you into his house there you shall savour unguessed wonders in life and come to advancement too will you return this way i, I cannot leave the justicing of my fiefs that has lately come upon me the wolves beyond Sithcalion would increase if they were left one season. Would you hunt wolves when you can hunt men, fierce men? I thought that courtiers only hunted women. I am your guest, Thane, and would be your friend. Have you no home to give a shrinking woman beside this threatening prison? I have a hunting lodge on the Black Mountain. Carry her thither from church, alone and free a woman does not wed to gain a mother nor does a man to acquire another sister are you a wedded man no then come to me for good advice upon your wedding eve and i will talk of what i know good night he passes up the stair out of sight when he reaches the arcade he puts out his head between two pillars and watches the envoy a moment with a face of mistrust and dislike then he withdraws and disappears the envoy goes to conan's chair after watching him mount the stair turns it away from the fire so that it commands doorway and staircase and seats himself shall i return this way i shall return as a ghost walks who has left a thing undone i shall eat this green oath's salt and be his guest his comrade his sworn friend his counsellor and sack his bed for him the mother bee that shall outtop her fellows is straitened in a blind and deepy cell as in this tower of darkness is this woman a spirit of power that shakes my mind is here in this resourceful woman 
she is as still as the white heat of a straight half-wrought sword that does not palpitate yet along its edge lives quiveringly she can indeed conceive its sudden and brief concentration of anger in icy tempering by her sharp life here but stillness is her operative condition nothing falters in her nothing shrinks she came to me with her eyes as if she made decision and her nearness of approach was more immediate than tenderness she came as close to me with her intention as an unexpected and convincing thought if i could add her even force to mine we could increase life's grasp he takes the flower from his jerkin dark unregarded bud of opening fate what is there now to do bring me no more fortune all is here deliver me from continuing chance stand still in thy unfolding now is my fortune manifested dissolve turn thou to fire and spirit and permeation and fix it here for ever he kisses the flower then drops it deliberately into the fire dark tableau curtains fall but remain closed only long enough for a brief orchestral nocturne to be played End of scene one Scene two of Gruach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gruach by Gordon Bottomley. Scene two the same the torches have burnt out the glow of the fire is still great enough to illumine the lower part of the hall but the upper part and the arcade are lost in darkness the envoy is asleep in the chair by the fire his head on his hand awakening and sitting up yes who is that disquiet that is not sound wakes me again i watch becalmed on a dark tide of sleep that has no murmurs yet when its small motion withdraws me from myself i hear each time a voice that has no substance too many men have died in this old fastness or else the spirits of its living cannot suspend their eager operation and sleep as bodies that waste must sleep i would pray to sleep if i could dream of her and to sleep long i lose myself in her with every thought yet when i lose myself in drifts of sleep she never comes as i would come to her i only hear behind a shaking curtain an unknown presence wrapped with rumorings of urgency quick flame and wilful wreck it seems she does not turn to me in sleep so i'll not sleep again a small light passes slowly from right to left along the high arcade. The envoy shifts in his chair and handles his dagger. A light? A light? Though light is honesty, yet light at midnight oftenest shines on knaves, and deeds of darkness sometimes seek a glimmer to bud and open in. Is this the oaf that comes to spy, or stab? Gruach descends the stair walking in her sleep and bearing a small and lighted night-lamp she is in her night-clothes and tumbled tangled masses of hair that escape from her nightcap fall about her like a golden shawl the envoy half rising lady how did you know she is unconscious of him and as she emerges from the arch turns from him toward the place where he stood at their first meeting she moves slowly and uncertainly and in bearing and demeanour reproduces fern's description of her appearance on the previous night beautiful stranger why are you here i did but change my gown and in a moment you come from empty valleys oh me if i had missed you my lord you are so kingly made fair and desirable i am drowned in flushes of gladness I would cover you with my being like a veil to hide you from women. 
I would pour out my being over you like faint moonlight that is yet universal, and enfolds kings and their kingdoms. Will you take me? Will you not? Aye. The light is going fast. I cannot see you plainly now. Oh, where, where are you? Here. Say it again. Tell me once more, blessed spirit. Repeat thyself. Be thine own mirror, and show me twice thy heart. When wilt thou take me? Now. You have gone farther off. Will you leave me? Whence do you speak to me? Out of the darkness. I shall not leave you until you bid me go. Am I a stranger now? I to myself am strange. I do not know my voice, my stumbling senses, or my will. But there is nothing strange in you, white lady. As in a welcome dream, nothing is strange when newly come delight seems in a moment to have been ours for life. I have believed that you were on the earth, as some believe in gods they cannot see. In this first hour, love is not born in me. I recognize, I remember, I possess. I am here to take my own. Yes, yes, oh, do not cease. You utter many words. I am tired, I catch in vain at them as they gleam past. But in your voice is truth, and truth that oftenest means unkindness. This once is joy. Men have too many words, but there's a word that holds all others as you hold for me the provocation of all disquieting women. This love is to strike deep, and when you awake you shall be sure of me. You shall devote fire of your brain, fire of your heart, to me. Where? Where? Your voice sounds close below me. You must not kneel to me. Come, come to me. I would bend down and clasp you into my breath, but creeping palsies hold me. My arms and thighs are heavy things that will not move for me. You know she binds me. You can loose me. You dare not act. Envoy, as he starts to his feet and approaches Gruach. Falter no more in the dim passages that in the outer walls of life's house burrow and endlessly return upon themselves. Awake, and with me dare. Awake, awake. Gruach, awaking, loosens her hold of her lamp, which goes out in falling. She stares, startled, then with a plaintive long sigh reels and sinks. The envoy reaches her barely in time to receive her in his arms. Have I broken the bird's wings to catch the bird? Have I shattered the door of her mind to enter there? This ruin is done in me. I have unbuilt the only hallowed place where I can worship. Her heart begins anew, and nascent life is trembling everywhere. He kisses her. Not any words shall peril her again by sudden occurrence. I'll use a quieter means, and through a more unwary sense infuse my life into her sources, into her thought. He kisses her repeatedly. Where am I? What have I done? Some distillation lately touched my lips. A freshness that awoke me lingers there. What will you do with me, beautiful stranger? Why are you here? Who are you? Go from my chamber. Loose me, leave me, loose me, let me go. She first seizes his shoulders to push him from her, then slips her arms about his waist and wrestles with him. Her onset almost overthrows him, and he only continues with difficulty to hold his own. Listen, I am the same Macbeth. It was the distillation of my soul. Thieves are men of the night, murderers are men of the night. You have the stoats and the fumart's passion for throats in the dark. You are not one who kills in the open. You would kill in sleep and in the vile safety of a private room. Ah, oh, fuck, you foul, treacherous beast! Aha! Aha! My hand is on your dagger. Let go your hold, or I'll drive it down the side of your neck. Strike! Her bare arm shoots up to bring the dagger down with force. He catches her wrist in the air. Lately I heard your spirit take a voice, and from outside our earth-taught reticence speak. Sure and clear and deathless and afar, like the first half-waked bird in spring's first dawn, 
its darkling dewy murmurs then gave up your mind to me your being to me would you undo it in a waking dream you you oh dangerous knife what thoughts have you pressed into its haft of old not many breaths ago its touch lit in me conceptions of destroying unknown to me my mind was ready and i did intend to strike you down and desolate my years the dagger falls from her hand speak softly my lord but speak how have you found my chamber look about you why have you brought me here you came alone were you here before me surely but why but why i have slept here had you then thought to meet me we might have met no more did you not care i cared to do your wish more than my duty i was cheated of choice your elder kinswoman denied to me your offered bridal bed i would have lain beside it on the floor deprived me of the kneeling-room you gave near to your feet at the altar and of the seat upon your bench at the board and left me nothing but leave to ride away before you rose i am sick in my limbs and my mind to learn so late i might have lost you while i dreamed of you for i have dreamed of you to-night my lord in the security of a sweet to-morrow i am sick in my reins and my compassionate body to feel each time you speak that i have meant to tear your flesh with a sharpened piece of iron you know what it means to me do you not and yet i do not know why i am here you sought in sleep the stations of our meeting as holy women the stations of the cross to act again life's chosen passionate hour i am not a sapless girl to walk and sleep i can control my force you came to me you told me all i know i did not speak i dreamed i heard your voice but not my own if women spoke in sleep they would awake they have suspicious ears what have i said the things you felt last night heart-shaking things that timid men teach women to wait to hear the truth of your live spirit loosed unaware that rising suddenly from ancient darkness took on its wings the light of the next dawn before the lonely night below was past the rapture of presence the offering of love the radiance of surrender of these you spoke all all is true what more have i said what else you uttered no more but love it was well said i could not say it now conscious that you would hear i am glad it is done and you i dreamed your voice but not your words the rapture of presence the offering of love a sense of strange remembrance i told of these i knew it all last night what will you do time and men's rules will part us quickly now and nothing will be left my father's race is ruined my mother's kin hems me in here in grim solicitude my cousin and his mother demand my hand they mean my land i cannot stand alone even the trees and mountains in this wildness huddle together against the blasts of time and planetary tempests what should i do this is my hour of fate this is the time when i must break the blind restricted seed that i am now move with the winds of life and yield my mental issue to them again or in this present burial rot and change is your love strength or weakness what will you do help me and now i shall not ride away as i was bidden i shall remain when Fortingal has all his guests about him, I will declare our love, and by the weight of Duncan's kinship, insisting on obedience, forbid your marriage until I come again, my errand to Caithness done, and claim your troth, marry you here, and carry you to Schoon. You will not get away from them alive. There are no king's men here and if the king sends men to look for you they will not know which rock in this rough valley was chosen for your gravestone you must ride now as you were bidden and yet you must not ride from me take me to schoon i should be here no more if you returned 
That will not much commend us to the king. Then I'll to Caithness too. But now, 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 you must ride now, and I must go with you. But shall we not be followed? To the death. Why must I risk your life? The chance is good. Conan can only think one thought at once. His hunt will storm to Inverness, while we ride north by east until we are far from here. And wed in Caithness Church? And swiftly are wed in the first church we come to when we are clear. Ride with me. Let us go. Sir, are you sure of me? Before you take me you should be told I was born your enemy. I am of a more ancient house of kings than you. King Kenneth was among my fathers. Then with your love you bring a power over many minds that, if we are added truly to each other, can set us higher than either house has stood. You can be great if you are so great-hearted. You are my Redeemer. You shall have my faith, service, and I can serve you with men's truth. Devotion, and I could wreck myself, my world, to reach its end your good. One thing is mordant in me at thought of you. When we fought body to body you overcame. I must undo it. Let us strive again. Come, let me grasp you. She holds out her arms to him. He takes her hands and draws her toward him. With a low cry she feigns to faint, and he catches her to him. She lays her head on his shoulder, and laughs lightly and gently. Circling each other so in soft enclosure, loosening our folds with mutual moving breath, our wreathing seems to rustle and expand, as crushed unwrinkling petals in a bud widen together in unbroken touch begin a blossom's effluence concede a blossom's trembling welcome to the night that fills it and that it believes it fills beloved we are foolish we should ride put on your clothes i go to saddle horses i have no clothes all that i ever had are in my chamber under the tower roof i dare not fetch them I might rouse many sleepers. Everything I have worn since my hair grew long was spun and woven and stitched in Fortingal. My kin shall feel my clouts flung back at them if I go out with nothing. I can endure it. I have gone barefoot in snow before to-night, and there is now no snow. You cannot live against the rushing sharpness if we push north to-night. Going to the curtained recess. There are furs here. You shall be wrapped in them. He brings furs piled on his arm and throws them down before her. No, not the white one. The white bearskin is ferns from Norway. She was born cold and bloodless. She is soon chilled. She needs it. Bring the wolf cloak. Put it round me. Your thin white feet are far too cold already to start on such a journey. Are there no shoes? Aye, in the tower. But shoes in the air are useless. We shall find old brogues in the stable. What horse shall I saddle for you? Saddle no horse for me. I must ride with you. Two tracks would tell our tale more certainly. Will you mount Black Fingal here? His hoofs would sound on the stones. Halter him to the ring at the outer gate. I will shortly join you there. Envoy having opened the door. Snow. There is snow. Oh, tranquil, dreadful, calm. Oh, deadly peace. We are shut back into the cast-off life by pale, relentless, softly closing gates that no man ever opened. We may not ride to-night. Your fate has fallen, or is it mine that hurts you? He throws open both doors. The ground is seen to sink sharply away from the threshold to a narrow white valley among white mountains. A faintness in the sky permeates a dense mist of lightly falling snow. O oh, joyful silence! soundlessly dropping curtains about the secret chamber of the earth that shall contain our bridal bed. O oh, sleep! The bride's white hush is in me. I will part the soundless curtains and meet what is within, either continuing sleep that can withdraw me from this dead life with love my latest hope, or delicate, wildering waking in some pale room to find my love with me. Will you not come, my lord? The snow is but assaulting yet. I go. 
for in an hour the breeding, feeding storm will cover our footprints, stifle all pursuit. We can point straight for Inverness, untracked, and thread the perilous pass ere drifts are deep. Know you the roads? I know them. I am ready. If the storm clears, our dark shapes will be seen afar in the thin air. She steps to the pile of furs, throwing off her cloak as she goes. Wear Conan's sheepskin coat. Help me to don Fern's bearskin cloak. Lift up the hood. Stay, stay, I must put up my hair first. She tears off her nightcap and throws it into the sinking fire. Oh, I have no pins. Where's your little dagger? Envoy, stooping where the dagger lies. It fell in the rushes. Gruick, holding her upcoiled hair with one hand. Give it to me. She thrusts it through the coil of hair. Cover my head with the hood. Is your horse dark like you? He is black as smoke. You can abandon him. Conan's white battle-horse will serve us better. Few men can see him moving against new snow. He saved me in a clenched stark river fight when armored men went down a falling spate and heavier horses under them. Again he saved me from a murderer in the night by crying out in his stall across a garth. When I shall enter the stable presently, he will speak to me before I am in his sight. He will stamp until I speak to him and touch. I cannot leave him here. You set me in more danger. Although you should devote your life to him, you cannot keep him more than a dozen years. Do you put a horse before me? Speak. Be sure. The king could send a rout of men-at-arms to claim him later, soon, in his own name. Turning to the door. Which is the horse? White Uthel is near the door. Shall I return for you? I would first write this life's last things. I cannot forego it now. Give me some leave to write on. I have nothing. Her scrivening skins are locked away. I have nothing. What is there in your wallet? Nothing is there save my king's letter to the Caithness Jarl. The margin of that will serve. We must not touch it, lady. The king's hand is hallowed. The king's seal is inviolable. With it I lose my life. Your life is not your own. It is now mine. Show me the letter. Beloved, it must not be. Gruach laying one hand on his shoulder and taking the letter from his wallet with the other. It must. It is my pride that it shall be. She breaks the seal and opens the letter. Your dear hands are soon cruel. Look, it is well. This piece is bare save for a superscription. And half of the king's name within the fold. It is too thick to tear. Not for the teeth. She bites the edge, then tears off one portion of the letter. Keep this. It is enough. I have not hurt you. There is still more left than the Jarl will care to read. I must blame some serving man for this. It is not wise for a well-born man to say he has been so familiar with a menial that such a letter could come into base hands. Dearest and dearer, pardon me for the sake of the true words I shall write on it to my kin. You have no pen. Gruach, searching among the ashes on the hearth. A wood coal twig writes well. Beloved, you loiter long. Hasten, and evermore hasten. The bridal dawn is near, my enemies awake. Envoy as he goes out by the great door. I serve you for ever, white spouse. I shall be ready ere you. He disappears downward to the right. Gruach lays the fragment of the letter on the table to the right, and stoops over it to write. Is it so soon? What, shall I suddenly believe this life is done and I can go? I am not foolish yet. In my deep places I know it is not so. I know the way in which hope gutters out in a cold draught, and life is seen to be a habit, heavy to put down courage, vision, and eagerness. The marvel of this night being perfect now, some meagre, unexpected chance can soon flaw and disperse it in a long, sick moment, perfection being momentary of nature, and when the kind, deceitful darkness over, impoverishing daylight shows to me the dead life here, I shall be here alone. Oh, let me dream anew, and in a dream of uttered scorn sting vivid life to spring back to my sinking heart. To the Lady of Fortingal, I am not of your blood to obey you. 
I will not mother your blood. I would live, so I leave you. For your lodging and nurture take the bride of Fortingall's clothes in payment. You will find a doll to fit them who will sit where you put her. I have given away my lands. Keep your hands and feet from them. To the heir of Fortingall. If you would be married, choose your wife for yourself. I have gone away with a man, and you will not see me again. To Fern. I leave you my love with my wisdom. When you meet a proper man, take him before another woman can. You will not come to life until you cross your own threshold and sit by your own hearth. Gruach. It is an aged woman's hand. I cannot write to-night. The hand may waver, the flanks shake, the limbs tremble as mine do now, and yet the heart may hold its firm and steadfast course untouched, being nearer to the mind. But here the immediate substance of my heart slackens and shivers, my mental force withdrawn. I have no strength to continue this delay. Oh, he is too long. Why should a fair strange man regard my lot or reverence my will? He need not do it. He will not come again, and this is all. I'll go to him. Is that a sound? A door upstairs? A footfall? She runs to the stairfoot and listens. Nothing. A gown trailing? Nothing. Nothing. Envoy, as he approaches the doorway from the right. The outer gate is locked. The key is here. She disappears through the low doorway to the right, and returns instantly with a large, long key. We can lock the door outside and ride away with it. <laughs> As we go down and pass the stable door, do not ask me to speak. Fingal would hear. Let me go first. Step then upon my footprints and wipe them off my kindred soil for ever. Before our life begins, before we go, tell in this hallowed place the name I have not heard, whose sound I await as waking eager birds await the light. Your name, my light, your name. Within the dark immuring womb a blind and unseen child is nameless, and I too, unliving and immured, will have no name in my subjection. This white waif of night shall have no name for you. The altar-priest shall speak it first to you. Before we leave this iron-coloured prison, vow you to me, that when you have the weight in the king's mind to do a lawless thing, you will return and tumble down these walls into a cairn of stones, and burn the stones to ash and dust wherein no weed will strike. This is a holy house for me. The hands I lay on it would turn to hands of blessing. The husk that has shed you is still a shrine, which in my old age I shall seek again. We cannot burn the past. It would stand yet in you, in me. Then let it stand for me. Lift up your hand and vow for love of me. I will do all that any man can do for love of you. Gruach, going to the hearth and gathering a handful of wood ash. It shall go down, or like a broken tree whiten and crumble to a hollow bone. The moon shall soften it to a cowering dread, and shapeless noises shall inhabit it. She moves slowly from the hearth to the great door, scattering the ash with a sower's motion as she goes. I sow, and I sow the chaff of the seed of fire. The waving, barren harvest of wilding flame shall here spring up, nourished by stormy air. Come, ruin, ruin and grief upon this old dwelling of sorrow and my captivity. My mother died of grief. It is not ill her hard, unfaithful race should die of grief. Come, ruin, down upon their greedy life, destruction and unseating of the mind, Woe be embodied to their unclosing eyes while brackish tears run down and lodge in their lips, and all they have flies up in flakes of flame, to fall as now these ashes. With the last word she reaches the threshold, where she turns to the envoy. Come, Macbeth. She goes out by the great door, and descending to the right, quickly disappears. The envoy follows her. 
After a short pause an owl cries twice with a long retreating sound, as if disturbed and flying away. A light passes from right to left of the high arcade. Donal descends the stair, a lamp in his hand. The stranger is not here. He is gone, maybe. That would be well. We want no king's men here, among the annoyances of a day of rejoicing. How cold the house is grown! Both doors left open. He has certainly gone. He must be highly born to be so careless. Snow, snow, snow. It is the last injustice of the order of things for snow to be added to the burdens of a feast day. Men will tread it in and out and in again. Fine ladies will tread it upstairs and downstairs and spread it with their skirts until the bride's chamber is like the track to the cow sheds in a wet autumn. I can but shoot it out a while. He turns to go out by the low door. Then he sees Gruick's letter on the table. A letter? This is the strangest courtesies. He is not graceless, though an upstarts man. Gruach, what have I here? The young man has truly gone, and with what he could carry. The new king's men are all reavers and robbers. I will not mother your blood. I have given away my lands. I have gone away with a man. You will not see me again. Oh, ho, oh, ho, here are great things to do. But which is first? He stands in deep consideration, the letter in his hand. A sound of scuffling and women's voices wrangling comes from the high arcade. Presently one of the young women hurries down the stair, pulling the girl after her by the arm and followed by the other young woman, who thrusts the girl forward from behind. The girl stands sobbing and rubbing her eyes. She is only half-dressed, and carries the rest of her clothes under her arm. "'Come on, onion-peeler, grease-skimmer, rancid rags. You shall learn not to lie in bed like an earl's daughter. I will not go. I will not. Like a bed. You ought to be up first. Pinching her. Will you remember? If you are not down in time to kindle my fires, you shall be pinched all over, all over, all over, until you are like a bush of ripe blackberries. So. Oh! And so. Oh! And so. Oh! I'll not bear it. I'll not stay, you murderers. My mother told me to go straight home to her if the kitchen ladies at the castle were unkind to me. Go home to her now. She'll be glad to see you. And gladder still to see old Margaret after you. I cannot help it. I cannot. Indeed I cannot. When I am with you by day I only see what is there. But every night when I am alone the sight comes on me. It will not let me sleep until the dawn begins. Then I am heavy and sick. Let me lie down. Pity, pity me. What do you see, you mole, when the sight is on you? I see the Lady Gruach. <laughs> <laughs> we all see Lady Gruach more than we choose. She never keeps us awake. Nor do we call it second sight when she appears. I tell you I see the Lady Gruach every night. She is covered from shoulder to foot with a trailing, spreading cloak that is not red like blood nor blue like the deep lake, yet gleams of both in the folds. It is covered with green, bright eyes. There are large green lights in her hair over both her ears. She wears a golden crown as if she is a queen. Her pitiless face alarms, yet I must look and look. Her gaze is hard to me, yet when we meet by day, she holds no memory of me in those cold eyes. Nightly she bears a dagger. Shivering liar, that finds you out. You have neither sight nor truth. Queens carry sceptres. They are not seen with daggers. And how can Grog ever become a queen? She is to at Long Conan, after sunrise. She bears a dagger, a red dagger. First young woman, seizing a tangle of the girl's dangling hair. Come on. Your second sight is not worth waiting for. You had better see your own ghost lighting fires, for that is all you are worth. Come on. Second young woman seizing the girl's hanging hair on the other side. 
Come down. Come down. You shall draw me the water. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Oh. They hurry the girl by her hair out through the low doorway to the right. She sobs and protests inarticulately and struggles as they go. The boy descends the stair quickly and follows the women out. Margaret follows the boy down the stair. The women are too noisy. Let them alone. The girl from the Clachan has been married at home. She needs rough teasing. They are not too rough. They are too noisy. They must be spoken to. Let them alone. There is a graver thing to speak of now. The man who yesterday eve knocked at our gate has carried off young Groach in the night. Go down and stop the roasting and the boiling. I go to raise the house and the whole township to send our riders to hunt the naughty child, and others to meet the wedding guests who ride and turn them home again. How have you heard of it? By Groach's hand. I found this writing on the table here. Margaret takes the letter, turns it about all ways, and throws it on the table. Leave it for others to find. All shall go on. Again, old friend, you are about to be a foolish, vain, officious, blind old man. What have you to do with it? What have I? Morag is aging. When the old devil dies, we do not want a ferret-eyed young mistress to keep us still uneasy. Let her go. Fern is mild. Conan will follow her. And let the feast go on. Conan would feast if Gruach were dead, and welcome the event that brought him many guests. He will not miss a bride he feared, if he may eat. Come down, I'll lift the crust of the lamb pie for you. She goes out by the low door. Elderly women believe they are always right, but this one may be, no. He follows Margaret out. The two serving men descend the stair. One supports the other. You are drunk. I am not drunk. I say you are drunk. I am not drunk. I was comfortable last night, but now I've slept it off. You can see for yourself. You have not had the time to sleep it off. We are fetched out of bed at an immoral hour. Ugh. A oh, most unhealthy hour. And a modest hour. But all will be well tomorrow in the morning. Uh, the new young mistress, oh, the pink and coy young mistress, will not forsake her bed tomorrow morn, at the unwise hours ordained by the old mistress. That is deep wisdom. You are drunk, nevertheless. I say, I am not drunk. They go out together affectionately by the low door. Conan descends the stair stealthily, peeping round the corner mistrustfully as he comes. He is in his shirt and cross-guarded braces, and barefooted. He holds a sword out of sight at his side. The disquieting stranger is gone. He is truly gone. He has not finished here. He will return. He shall not pass my outer gate again. But he is gone. I should be easy now if this were not my wedding day. The thane of Ardvin's daughters will look at me, to watch with mocking eyes what I shall do, and Gruach will not look at me, nor seem to know I stand or kneel or sit by her. But that's no grief. When she does look at me, she brims with discomfort. She's not fit to be a wife. She follows her own will. I'd leave her wed the bridge and blacksmith's daughter. She fills her clothes as well as my lady cousin, and her lips bring thoughts of dew on rosy plums. I'm not afraid to touch her. If I touch Gruach, I feel her body go hard beneath my hand, and danger crouching there. If she does nothing, she makes me feel outside her. I would not wed her if she had no land. The inconvenient wisdom of my mother is not to be avoided. Land is land. The nightly stranger shall not imperil it. He is gone. Oh, it is early. I'll get to bed again and sleep till I am called. He turns to ascend the stair. Curtain. 
End of Scene 2 End of Gruach by Gordon Bottomley